physicsninja.org. Uh, hi, everybody. I now want to use Gauss's law for cases that have cylindrical symmetry. So let's go look at a case where we have a very long, thin wire, and another case where we have a thicker wire that has a uniform charge density through it. So let's go see how we can calculate the electric field using Gauss's law for cases that have cylindrical symmetry. Okay, so here's our wire. We have a long wire, it has a charge density uh, lambda, which is basically just the charge per unit length of that wire. And we wanna see how we're gonna apply Gauss's law up here uh, to this particular problem. Just like we did before, the first thing to do is to look at the symmetry of the object. Now, we also know that if you take any point out here in space, well, what you're gonna find is the electric field produced by uh, the wire will have to be radially outwards. If you consider any little bit of charge over here, there's always another piece of charge that's kind of symmetric, but on the other side um, of the line joining the wire, or the perpendicular bisector. So what you have here is that uh, this top bit of charge will produce an electric field, say that is pointing away from it, and the bottom one will produce an electric field that's pointing away from it. So the total electric field is going to have to be in this direction. Okay. So once you've kind of convinced yourself that the electric field is going to be radially outwards, uh, the next thing you have to do now is simply apply Gauss's law, keeping this in mind. Okay, so let me go ahead and just uh, delete this and see how we apply Gauss's law now uh, to this particular problem. Let me redraw my wire. Let's try to do a straight line here. I think I figured out how to do this. All right, it's a little thinner than it was, but that's okay. And maybe let's move it over. All right, so let me start off like we did with the sphere. First thing you want to do now is to produce a Gaussian surface around this object that has the same symmetry as the object. So for that, we're gonna just produce another cylinder. So let me draw it here. Okay, so just like we did before, we have to just evaluate both sides of Gauss's law based on this uh, surface here. So how do we evaluate the left-hand side of Gauss's law for something with a cylindrical symmetry? Well, again, we have to note that the electric field everywhere on the surface is going to be constant and it's going to be pointing away from it. So that allows us to simplify this. So remember, this integral here is over the entire surface. So it's over the top, it's over the bottom, and it's over the sides, as I've shown here. However, the top and the bottom, we don't have to worry about it because the normal for the top and the bottom is going to be like this. Okay. Here's the vector, the area vector for the top and the one for the bottom. However, we know that the electric field is going to point radially outwards. Therefore, those vectors are going to be orthogonal and you're not going to get any contribution from the top and the bottom surface. There is no flux, electric flux going through the top surface nor the bottom all of the electric flux is going through the side. So that really simplifies our expression. All we have to do now is simply evaluate this on the side. Okay, so for our left-hand side, let me make the pen a little bit smaller here. For the left-hand side, we simply have to simplify this expression. And since E is constant everywhere on that surface, you can take it out of the integral. And now I'm left with just integrating the area of the side wall of my Gaussian surface. Well, the area of the side wall is simply going to be uh, the circumference, which is 2 pi r, where r is uh, simply the distance to the wire of this Gaussian surface. And remember, I need the area, so I also want to multiply times the length. And the length is going to be this guy. So that's it. This is the left-hand side of Gauss's law for a cylindrical object. Now we have to evaluate the other side. How much charge is actually enclosed here? 
let me divide by epsilon zero. So the amount of charge that's enclosed here, well, it's simply going to be the line density. And the line density multiplied by the length that I'm considering for this Gaussian surface. That's how much charge is enclosed, and I can't forget to divide through by my constant epsilon zero. So now you can put everything together. And if you put everything together, you're going to get E, 2 pi r multiplied times the length uh, equals to lambda times the length divided by epsilon zero. And we can simplify this a little bit. We have the length that appears on both sides. So at the end, what I'm left with is the electric field from this very long wire simply going to be the charge density divided by 2 pi epsilon zero and r. Okay, and if it's a positive charge density, the electric field will point away from the wire. If it's negative, it'll point toward. Uh, but the dependence on the distance, it's a 1 over r dependence. So if you just make a sketch here, so plotting what the electric field magnitude looks like as a function of r, it's just a 1 over r dependence. Okay, so that's proportional to 1 over r. So there you have it. That's applying Gauss's law to uh, a long wire, looking at the right and the left hand side of Gauss's law, pretty straightforward for uh, this particular example. Okay, now I want to look at the thick wire which uh, has a radius A. Um, it's also going to have a uniform charge density which I've denoted as rho, so that's the charge per unit volume of the cylinder. Now since we're looking at an object with a finite size, we're going to look at the inside of the wire and the outside separately. For the inside, what you want to do is you want to draw a Gaussian surface that has the same symmetry as your object. So that would simply be another cylinder that is inside our wire. Uh, this smaller cylinder is going to have a radius r. It has the same length as the wire. Um, therefore, we can just go right ahead and apply Gauss's law to it. We don't have to worry about the top and bottom. There is no electric flux going through there. So all we have to do is just worry about uh, what's going on at the, the side walls of that cylinder. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law, since the field will be uh, constant everywhere on that surface, simply the electric field magnitude multiplied with the area of that surface which is uh, the circumference times the length. It's pretty straightforward. And now we want to know how much charge is actually enclosed within this red Gaussian surface here. Well, that's easy. That's just the charge density multiplied times the volume of this cylinder. Uh, the volume of the cylinder is simply going to be the cross-sectional area up there, which is pi r squared. That's the area of the top multiplied times the length of the wire. So this term up here is the charge enclosed. Now I have to divide through by epsilon zero. So now you can simplify a few things here. You can simplify the length. Uh, there's a factor of pi here that appears on both sides. There's an r and an r squared, so I can get rid of one of those. And at the end, what you're left with is uh, the electric field is simply going to be our charge density divided by 2 epsilon 0. And you can't forget about this r dependence over there. Multiply times r. So here's our expression for the magnitude of the electric field inside the wire. So we have a term that is linear with r with the distance away from the center of the wire. What about outside the wire? Outside the wire, what you have to do is we're going to draw a separate Gaussian surface. Draw it in blue here. So outside the wire, it simply is just another larger cylinder. And a larger cylinder is also going to have a radius r. And if you want to apply Gauss's law to this blue surface, well again, the Left hand, left hand side of Gauss's law looks exactly the same for objects with cylindrical symmetry. This is always the same. And this is going to be equal to 
well, how much charge is actually enclosed in this blue surface? Well, that's simply the total charge of the wire inside that surface. So it's the charge density multiplied times the volume, not of the blue cylinder, but the volume of the actual wire. And the volume of the wire is simply pi a squared multiplied times the length. Again, uh, don't forget to divide through by epsilon zero. So once again, you can simplify quite a few terms here. There's the length that appears on both sides. There's a pi factor. Uh, what else? Oh, that's about it. And now if I simply isolate the magnitude of the electric field, uh, what I'm left with is two epsilon zero in the denominator. I have my charge density. I have the uh, radius squared. I have a r at the a denominator as well. Okay, so this is one way of writing it. So you see the functional form is different when you're outside the wire. Uh, when you're outside the wire, it simply looks like a one over r dependence, similar to that very long thin wire that we had before. If you substitute now what our volume charge density is, uh, you can write this as Q divided by 2 pi. Notice this A squared here, if I substitute, if I eliminate the volume charge density, it's going to cancel with this other A squared. So you're going to be left with uh, Q over L, um, R, and there's an epsilon 0 there. And Q over L, remember what Q over L is. Q over L is basically my, my line density. How much charge you have per unit length. So actually, when you're outside the wire, the field simply looks exactly like the field produced by a uh, by the wire, or in a very thin wire, just like the previous case. So if we go ahead and sketch that, if we want to sketch what the electric field looks like as a function of distance. So when you're within the wire, when R is less than the radius of the wire, we have a straight line. And when you're outside the radius of the wire, we have a field that drops off as 1 over R. Something like this. So this is 1 over R. And this guy over here is proportional to the distance. Okay, so to recap, whenever you have an object now that has cylindrical symmetry, uh, we simply have to look at uh, the left-hand side of Gauss's law, and the form is a little bit different than uh, the spherical case, but pretty straightforward. Okay. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave a comment or send me an email. Thank you for watching. physicsninja.org